Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Surya Gangadharan. I have with me Mr. Nazir Kabiri. He's of the Biruni Institute in Kabul, uh, which is a think tank focused on regional connectivity and integration. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kabiri, um, is Afghanistan getting tired of the discord in South Asia because of the, uh, which has resulted in lack of connectivity, integration and so on? Thank you, Surya Ji, for having me in the show. Uh, as you know, Afghanistan became the, the most recent member of the Sark family after the new Afghanistan was being uh, uh, introduced some 20 years ago. But the issue here has been that uh, I think the, the political rivalries, particularly on the side of the, some of the neighbors, uh, using uh, terrorism as a tool of the foreign policy is uh, stopping a lot of initiatives under SARC like the motor vehicle and rest of the initiatives proposed by SARC. SARC as an institution didn't fail us. It's us failing the SARC as an institution, I believe. So in that sense, I think Afghanistan as a younger member of the, the South Asia and SARC family, in a sense, is feeling pushed out of uh, SARC. We are being denied basic connectivity with South Asia through Pakistan. Uh, uh, and this uh, has created a lot of hurdles. So we are looking to diversify towards Central Asia, perhaps towards West Asia. So I, 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 our understanding is that the rest of the nations here, part of the SARC, has been a little too patient uh, mm. for this non-cooperation. 75 years of non-cooperation is uh, a lot of patience. True. Uh, but again, for us, I guess, in a sense, we are also looking into the alternatives. Should South Asia not put the facts together, we have to be diversifying towards other options. We are working with Iran uh, and India on Chabahar. And also we are working on into um, the bilateral um, uh, programs with rest of our neighbors in Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. But again, should there be a situation where this potential of connectivity is being unlocked, we are beautifully located between the two sub-regions. Central Asia and South Asia and Afghanistan is officially considering itself as a transit country for connectivity, for pipelines, for electricity transmission, connecting two subcontinents. One, uh, Central Asia being rich of so much uh, uh, God-given uh, natural resources and landlocked, and double landlocked in a sense, in a mood to diversify, badly in a mood to diversify towards South Asia. But again, South Asia being blocked uh, uh, that doesn't help things. So in, again, South Asia is in great need of those natural resources from gas pipelines to electricity. Every single tra electricity transmission line must come through Afghanistan. So this is the kind of location we are speaking about. But if uh, South Asia in a sense fails to put the tax together, which has been the case with the SARC and rest of our uh, counterparts, and there are now a few other initiatives like BIMSTIC, yeah. Bay of Bengal type of activities and initiatives. I think if that's working for the rest of the region, that's fine. Yeah. But unfortunately, we as a member of the family, you don't we benefit. feel pushed out. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked of Iran. Again, Iran is under sanctions, you know. Does it work there? Iran uh, is under sanction, but, uh, uh, but our project, the, this trilateral initiative of Chabar, is being exempted. A lot of credit goes to India and Afghanistan uh, for lobbying this with the American counterparts and they have understood the important strategic importance of Chabahar. They have officially exempted any investments uh, to do with the Chabahar in Iran. But again, uh, uh, the criticism here is that there is the speed at which yeah. things are being developed. Chabar has been in discussions from 2003, uh, the agreements were being signed and then later on we, we do see some movements but not that a lot. I think uh, the way we conduct projects or deliver international development projects needs to be re-evaluated. Uh, there needs to be a new momentum to get Chabar developed. Uh, otherwise, people are losing hope and patience. Uh, I think the speed at which Chabar is being uh, <coughs> developed, as discussed in a few of the panels, are, 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 is not satisfactory. Mm -hmm. Now, Afghanistan has a small border with China up in the north, the Wakhan Corridor. Uh, is there any feasibility of that area being opened up to Chinese trade and uh, investment? Uh, I think in future, uh, if, should Afghanistan be more peaceful, that will be the, uh, the, the fastest and uh, most direct route for Chinese to diversify West uh, through, Central Asia, through Afghanistan to Central Asia in Iran and Europe. Mm. That route is uh, uh, potential, but it's a very rigid terrain. 
uh, one has to look into the feasibility of those uh, uh, projects. But again, there has been some discussions between the Afghan government and Chinese government to do some feasibility uh, if they could do a corridor uh, for Afghanistan directly through that Wakhan uh, uh, corridor in the northern Badakhshan province of Afghanistan. This discussion has been there, but I'm not very much up to date on, on what is the status of the progress. But that is a potential and a very direct route for Chinese and preventive intervention through Afghanistan to Iran and rest of the sub-region. What about the rest of Central Asia? You have borders with Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, what is the potential of uh, some kind of integration happening there? Uzbekistan and uh, Kazakhstan are the two largest economies of Central Asia. Uh, same like South Asia. Uh, being post-colonial Central Asia is post-Soviet. Yeah. But luckily they have already uh, settled their issues and disputes 20 years down the road. They have proven their identities yeah. and now they have started integrating again. Uzbeks, Tajiks, Turkmens, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, even Mongolia in a sense are part of a number of initiatives and platforms, namely like Karak and the rest. We are working with the Central Asians. A number of flagship projects are being designed. One is being CASA. 1,000 electricity transmission project from Kyrgyz to Tajik and from there all the way to Pakistan via Afghanistan as a transit country. Mm -hmm. Another example is of course TAPI at which India is also a party. Yeah. So Central Asia is having great potentials and they are open for business. They want to diversify. They understand the importance of Afghanistan and South Asia in a sense as, as an emerging market. But the, the ma major issue here is, has been the blockade. Uh, Afghanistan is being denied basic connectivity. Afghanistan and India are being denied yeah. overland basic connectivity towards uh, through Pakistan. And uh, this has been a serious issue for us, for our tra traders and goods, uh, and for the Central Asian products as well. We can trade to uh, uh, Pakistan and under a number of agreements, namely APTA, Afghan traders are allowed to be using technically on the paper, any uh, uh, ports within Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in practice, we are not able to, Indians are not able to receive our goods yeah. and, and authority and similarly, they cannot uh, uh, trade with us. Mm -hmm. They cannot uh, export via authority. That's an issue and that is economically not viable for us. So uh, that's why I think they are trying to develop Chabar, but that's also taking a lot of time. Yeah. So my our argument is that we are being officially in a sense pushed out of the South yeah, Asian yeah. Uh, con continent uh, region uh, and uh, we are looking uh, forward to be diversifying more towards Central Asia and they are having a lot of potential naturally bestowed with a lot of minerals clean hydropower electricity uh, uh, but unfortunately landlocked mm -hmm. you mentioned um, that uh, India is not involved in these talks peace talks that are going on and uh, the impression one got is that India is perhaps a little out of tune with what is happening politically and as far as peace talks are concerned. Uh, is, that, is that what you were trying to uh, indicate? The landscape is changing very rapidly and quickly. India is a trusted partner of Afghanistan last 20 years. But if we, don't have, if we no longer have the luxury of having international forces with us, yeah. like the US and rest of our counterparts, what's the solution? One has to look into the possibility of a peace reconciliation process. The one which is started led by the US and then the second round of that is going to be Afghan, uh, uh, intra-Afghan type of dialogue. <clears throat> Our argument is that perhaps India can play a positive role understanding the overall changes in the, in the region uh, and the new uh, <clears throat> uh, sort of developments. I think India uh, can play a constructive role and our argument is that India could possibly be engaged in a constructive manner, support the wider consensus in Kabul, uh, uh, who are the, the elites and majority of the politicians and majority of the people who are in support of the ongoing peace process as a, as a, as a, a beacon of hope. Uh, any opportunity for peace should be uh, utilized, uh, being, be it led by, by the US or facilitated by rest of our counterparts or countries in the region. And India is one of those countries that we trust and similarly we expect them to be paying, uh, playing a positive role and, and, a, and a constructive role as they are already uh, playing in, in Afghanistan's peace politics. Should uh, there be a breakthrough, we all hopefully will benefit and there could be possibility of future engagements and developed cooperation post-peace in Afghanistan with the help of India. You expect if there is a peace development in Afghanistan, things stabilize, 
do you see the prospect of uh, the uh, current blockade by pakistan being lifted i uh, i i don't know but this has been going on even before yeah. <laughs> there was a war in afghanistan this is a history of a uh, history of 75 years yeah, uh, yeah. after the division uh, both countries needs to be more creative both india and pakistan to see uh, and perhaps calculate the cost of non cooperation how yeah. much is that blockade affecting the wider region how much of it uh, is affecting the uh, the uh, growth in pakistan and india uh, trade the flow of trade from central asia to south asia is in the best interest of everyone yeah uh, in the best interest of pakistan and the best interest of uh, uh, india should uh, this uh, blockade or this this uh, sort of uh, uh, denial of basic legitimate trade is being lifted i think uh, we we call on both of the countries to come to be a little more creative understand the power of economics the power of connectivity uh, uh, there is uh, a requirement from both sides a genuine sort of uh, 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 sense of cooperation is required to lift this out because people are being hurt on both sides of the border. Last question. Um, there has been some talk about perhaps uh, a more assertive role by the United Nations here. Do you think a United Nations peacekeeping force over there would make any difference to the current situation? I think uh, for some basic uh, sort of uh, 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 peacekeeping. Uh, the same as it was uh, introduced um, after the bond process a peacekeeping mission was dispatched to afghanistan and a number of countries contributed yeah. to the process and those who are called international security assistance forces isaf namely in afghanistan we had the experience that uh, it was helpful uh, but post peace perhaps uh, a mission similar to that is required subject to the uh, uh, negotiations with the, with the Taliban and what comes out of the deal in yeah. Doha. Uh, a UN-led peacekeeping mission could be more neutral yeah. compared to the coalition-led uh, peacekeeping mission. Uh, but again, the cost of it and, and yeah. the wider consensus around such kind of mission is something to be debated. Mr. Kabiri, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.